Hi, my name is Roy Collin and welcome to the show. I've also got five podcasts, The Awakening Podcast, Exposing Fraud and Corruption, but with Solutions, The Crypto Podcast, on about all things blockchain, NFTs, crypto, The Meditation Podcast, talking about all different types of meditation, but there's also meditations there from one minute to two hours. And the other one is the Learn Polish Podcast, so if you're interested in learning Polish, you can do that. And the other one is speaking with Roy Collin, and I just have guests from around the world talking about either public speaking or also about their book or just general life in general. And you'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. I'm also a podcasting coach. And you see the QR code there, and it's also on my link as well. And if you're interested in actually going on some podcast shows, I'm helping people doing that. Or if you're interested in sponsorship, you can contact me. And I'd like to thank my sponsor, DanielPacker.com. He helps people with anxiety, stress, and addictions. He's got a 90% success rate, and you only pay for successful. So be sure to check him out, DanielPacker.com. I hope you enjoy this week's show. Welcome to the Meditation Podcast. My guest today, he's from Ohio and the USA, a lifetime educator, entrepreneur, and an author. Please welcome Mike Barnes. Hey, how you doing, Roy? Good to be Mark here. Mark Barnes, apologies, Mark. Oh, oh, no problem. I didn't, I didn't even catch that. You wouldn't, I couldn't tell you how many times I've been called Mike in my life. So, <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, uh, appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, not looking forward to it. So, I mean, I mentioned the kind of bullet points, but you might let the listeners know a little bit more about Mark. Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. Um, yeah, as you said, a uh, lifelong educator. I taught in the, the classroom at both the junior high and high school levels for, uh, I think it was about 23 years. I taught um, to, uh, burgeoning teachers in, at the college level for, I don't know, maybe another two or three years. So uh, I've, I've got a, a lot of years in education. And then, you know, when I left education, I got into the book writing and publishing world and have worked on books for teachers and school leaders uh, before now graduating to uh, working on you know, after 50s life and and talking all about uh, how to live a long, healthy, joy-filled life, including, of course, with meditation. Fantastic, fantastic. So I suppose let's just delve into the meditation journey and then we can touch on the education because it's a fascinating subject. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, um, when I, I left the classroom, uh, oh man, it's almost like 13 years ago now. And uh, I was on this journey then where I was going to, you know, get out and talk to teachers. I had a book that was fairly popular about teaching and learning, and people were inviting me to come and talk to their teachers and coach them and help them be better, which was great. But, you know, it was a big transition. And this is one of the things we talk about in Hacking Life After 50 is, you know, when we get to that sort of 50 and beyond, there's a lot of transitions in life. It's not just retirement, but there's a lot of things you do that are transitions those can bring on some anxiety. So when I made that move, you know, I left something that was, I was used to doing for decades, you know, and I had a routine and suddenly that routine was disrupted. And then I found myself, you know, on planes and traveling and staying in hotels and being out greeting people and, you know, and running uh, coaching sessions. And it, it was, it was tricky. I was away from home a lot. I wasn't used to it. I was pretty nervous. And, uh, you know, I, I had a doctor's appointment. I talked to my doctor about it and she was asking me all about health in general, but then asked me about my you know, mental and emotional state. And I said, you know, I, I find that I'm really struggling right now. I'm nervous. I'm, I'm, you know, stressed because of this big life change. Well, she suggested meditation. Well, I didn't know much about meditation at all back then. So, you know, um, you know, she said, you know, find a quiet place and whatever. So I, I gave it a shot. And uh, I, I got to tell you, you know, which I think is true of a lot of people who are starting in meditation. I wasn't good at it. I, I didn't, you know, I felt like my mind was just wandering all over the place and I was antsy and I, I gave it up pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, I, I returned to it, you know, I, I got to say almost a decade later, right about when COVID hit in, in 2020 and, you know, everybody was stressed, right? And, and I just needed to get back to it. But what I did is I got a little bit more serious in my approach and I started reading about it and, and watching videos and, you know, listening to podcasts and people who talked about it and practiced it. And, uh, you know, I, I got better. No, that's fantastic. Because I mean, a lot of people, they say, I tried meditation, it didn't work. And I think what you just mentioned is the most important thing. 
you decided to study and understand the people that's talking about it because like a lot of people think you need to have a clear mind and there's different ways you can do it with your eyes open and everything and i think it's just finding what's right for you and then yeah. it's like you know you mentioned the anxiety and everything when you realize mm. hey this is actually helping me i'm more chill i'm i'm not reacting as 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 the way i was this is actually a system that's good and just kind of delving, but it's the most important thing. And that goes back to the education then, because at the end of the day, you know, there's nothing in life. I know a lot of people think whether it's public speaking or anything that you just become brilliant at it. The reality is anybody, they decide I'm going to study this and, you know, really get good at it. So what I want to delve into, because with all, I mean, I've interviewed hundreds of people, especially on the speaking one. And the one thing that, a lot of people mention it's either a teacher made or break broke them. And it's it, like people don't realize how powerful the education system can be in both ways. And I, I'll give an example. The other day, is, I listened to a podcast called The Blind Boy. And the, the girl that was on, she like her parents were heroin addicts and basically just abused from a young age. And it was a teacher. She said two teachers helped her. One taught her how to clean herself. And another went to the home and said, you know how good your child is and everything. And it gave her such inspiration. She became a doctor and just changed her life around based on the teachers that actually done that. And then other sides then is a teacher can insult you in front of people, which stops a person from performing and thinking like, because I know that happened to me. They'd get you to speak in class. Dude, I'd get paranoid and they start mocking you. And, and then they'd insult you in front of a classroom at 30. And then you just assume, OK, I shouldn't be doing this. And I mean, obviously, you've seen that in, in your career, but probably even now, usually when you step away, you actually realize the whole, you know, how it all comes together and how you can help people. Yeah, for sure. That, that's a great way to uh, analyze the whole teaching and learning process. And I got to tell you, I, I have been on both sides of that. You know, uh, when I was a young teacher, you know, a lifetime ago, uh, I, you know, I was new and I, I honestly didn't feel like I had been given all the instruction I needed as a young teacher. And, you know, I had a lot of those moments where I, I said things that, you know, were way out of line with kids. And, you know, I was sort of a, a hard nosed, you know, my way or the highway guy. And, you know, I would say that to kids, you know, if you want to be successful, you, you do it my way. And, you know, occasionally you would say something that you didn't think was harmful, but you don't look at it from other people's perspective. So I did a lot of that. And over the years, I, I think I learned that, you know, especially when I had my own kids, you know, you, you want you want your kids treated right. And I got better at that and better at listening. And that that's kind of what we teach in Hacking Life After 50 when we get to things like meditation, you know, for one, uh, we try to take the simple approach. You know, I, I think there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of mythology around what meditation is. And, and, you know, I said earlier that I was unsuccessful when I first started because I didn't know going back to that teaching and learning, right. I hadn't been taught. I hadn't studied anything. I hadn't researched it. And uh, I, I just didn't really get it, but the more I learned, the better I got. And that's what we do is we say, you know, it, what you think of meditation or what you've heard may not always be right that there are many different ways to do it. And, and in Hacking Life After 50, you know, we, we just, we spend part of a chapter on it. And, and that, that whole chapter we call nurture. And it's really about, you know, being good to your emotional self, to your, your mind, your body, your soul. And, and we talk about how you can do this. And we have a section called what you can do tomorrow in every chapter. And we, there's where we're relying on our teaching experience. And we say, okay, you do have to learn. You may want to do some more research, but here are some things you can do right now to get started and, and you know that's what we're hoping people will do get started okay i mean i'm uh i think it's like five weeks i'll be 51 so it's i'm in that category so like what's the main thing because i mean obviously there's a lot of different things but we, I, I, the way i look at it in life we like say water and stuff like that that's very important we put our energy into that and concentrate make sure we get the best but with what you're kind of writing and doing what do you suggest is kind of the priority yeah well you know we start with with purpose in, in the beginning of hacking life after 50 we we have a, a whole chapter dedicated to purpose what we say is i talked about transition earlier that when people get to that point of transition in life 50 and beyond 
oftentimes there's pretty big life changes. You know, you it, maybe you're either thinking of retiring or you have retired or you've transitioned to a new career. Maybe you were a parent and now you're an empty nester. You know, the, the kids are gone. Um, and and we we tend to sometimes think, I don't have anything left. You know, what what now what am I going to do? Because our lives were dedicated to profession, parenting, you know, whatever. So now we say, okay, now what's left in after 50s life? What do I have? So we talk about goal setting and discovering the things that are frustrating to you and then setting some goals around the things we're discussing around physical well-being, emotional and mental well-being, uh, and, and about keeping momentum in your life. So that's a big one. And then, of course, we do get into the physical side because that's important. And, and it goes along with the mental side. And all of these things sort of stack together. We talk about physical well-being and provide some pretty simple solutions uh, for, you know, um, eating right and staying fit and moving and all of those things. And then we get into the emotional and we talk again about meditation and about breathing the right way. I heard, I heard one of your shows where you had a, a woman on whose name I can't remember, but she talked a lot about breathing. And I thought that I was like, wow, that, that sounds a lot like what we say. So, you know, and then in the end, we just, we talk about thriving. We say, you know, we promote the idea in hacking life after 50, that the second part of life, and we sort of divide life into two parts up to 50 and after, and we want to get to a healthy hundred and beyond. We say, you know, we think the second half of life can be the best. Not that the first wasn't wonderful. And if you had kids or you had grandkids or whatever, you're nurturing them, that's great. But we think the second half can be even better. We've got more time to do things. And, and we promote the idea of curiosity, adventure, risk-taking, things we were more apt to do in the first half of life. And we really want to stick with them in the second half. Brilliant, brilliant. And I mean, I love the way that you kind of, start with purpose because i remember when i was working uh, in ireland and like you see people they'd retire and within three months they were dead it's like that's coming down to the purpose because their life was their job and it's the same thing you know sometimes they're at home and like if they're just sitting down you know flicking through the tv and things like that there's just they're just chugging through life and it's so important and i think just on that alone you know just to, to kind of think What's the best way? And do you do any kind of, like, because what, my grandmother lived till she was like 96. And one thing that I saw with her is actually always kind of reading and doing the crossword, just keeping the brain kind of active. Is that stuff that you're touching on? Yeah, totally. We we have, uh, we, we talk about with this whole idea of purpose and momentum, and, and we use the phrase momentum mindset. And we talk a lot about uh, how, if you want to stay mentally sharp, which is really important, as you said, for someone living a long life, my parents both lived into their 90s. So one of the things is to be a lifelong learner. And, you know, that sounds like a pretty simple thing to say. But as you just noted, a lot of people when they when they age and, and get in that mindset of, well, I'm kind of done, I did everything. It's easy to just kick back and do nothing. You know, it is easy to sit around. It's easy, you know, you get up in the morning, and go, well, I don't have anything to do today. I don't have any responsibilities. So we talk about, uh, you know, sort of making this second act of life a journey and almost uh, think how you did when you were younger. You know, if you were in your teens or 20s, you were educating yourself. Maybe you go to college or you go to trade school or something and you're planning for a career. So it's easy for the young people to say, I've got this purpose. So what we say is, what are some things you might want to do or you might be interested in that you've never done or you've never even tried, or you thought, I can't. Well, now that you have more time on your hands, which is, is typically a, a gift of after 50s life is the gift of time. We say, let's start exploring. And again, in, in Hacking Life After 50, in, in each chapter or hack, we have these what you can do tomorrows. And we do encourage a lot of um, inventorying yourself. What am I interested in? What do I want to do that I've never done before? What can I do? Uh, where do I need to improve? And this is all a part of that momentum mindset. And once people start writing this stuff down, then we say, okay, now let's set some goals around it. If it's fitness, if you say, well, I'm in my 60s or 70s and I don't feel great, well, let's do something about that. 
And, and there's some simple strategies for that. You know, we talk about strength training and it, you know, the book isn't all about diet. It isn't all about weightlifting or anything like that. It's about a general well-being. So we want to work in small increments and build lifelong habits. And like I've all of my life, you know, I into sports, I always loved playing football, doing different things. And it was squash for a, a lot of the last few years. But then when, you know, the lockdown happened, everything was kind of shut. And I, 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 I noticed I kind of put on a few kilograms and decided, and I was never into a gym, but I said, all right, this is the only thing because, you know, the squash and plus squash, you know, when you hit 50, it's kind of like not, not the best as well because it's kind of high impact and everything. And like what, what I love to see is there was all ages there. I mean, obviously, you have a lot of young people, and but there was people in their 70s and, you know, there's plenty of different exercise they can be doing. And I think some people think you have to be young to go to the gym and right. you have to be living he heavy weights. At the end of the day, you can be on a walking machine, a bicycle machine, and lifting very light weights. You can do work it and build up and like what's good. That I mean, I presume like there's, there is people that have that block in their head. They think, no, I can't do this. I'm 60 or I'm 70 or whatever. Yeah, absolutely right. When in in our chapter on uh, resistance training, we we call it reclaim muscle because what happens is as early as your forties, muscle tends to degenerate, and and that's a real problem with the the physical being. That's a real problem. Uh, every decade, muscle will degenerate, muscle mass. If you aren't, you know, treating it, if you're not exercising in some way, if you're not lifting, and and what we promote is functional movement. So you think about as you really age, what are the things you do now that you want to continue to do? Well, one is get up, right? <laughs> you want to be able to sit down, stand back up, and hopefully do that without helping yourself or using any sort of a uh, any device to help you to get up, an apparatus, a chair, a cane, whatever. And the, the best way to do that is to treat those functional movements. So yeah, we talk about resistance training and we do address what you just said, Roy, that idea that, oh my goodness, I, I haven't been a weightlifter and these guys are going to tell me to run to the gym and start lifting hundred pound weights. You know, we, we don't do that at all. We do talk about the gym. We talk about things you can do, things that we have practiced because we're practitioners. So we've tried all kinds of things, but one of the big things we love and we promote is think of things you can do even at home and think of things you can do with your body weight that really enhance those functional movements, uh, sit on the floor. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't do that. And, you know, we mentioned tons of resources in our book. And one of them is the, uh, the blue zones, which is studied and written about by Dan Buettner. And there's that, there's actually a Netflix special on this. Now, if people have Netflix and want to check that out, the blue zones are places around the world where people live the longest, they live into their hundreds and beyond. So we're big fans of that. And what we have found is there's a lot of overlap in the things they do. So one of them is movement. And what uh, Dan Buettner, the author of the Blue Zones, found is that he went to these people's houses, you know, some are in there, they're all over the world, one's in Okinawa, Japan, um, he would go and visit the people in their homes. And he said that one of the things that amazed him is that they didn't have a lot of furniture. And he talked to people who were in 100 years old and beyond, and they sat on the floor. And he said, I was amazed at how much they sat on the floor. And I thought, well, why wouldn't you sit in a chair? He said, then he talked to him about it. And they said, well, I'm getting up. I'm sitting down. I'm getting up. I'm sitting down from the floor. I'm using my legs. I'm twisting and turning, push, pull, squat. These are the key foundational movements. And he said, you know, they were amazing. People were gardening. Again, not lifting weight, but using resistance or maybe lifting weight if it's a, a barrel of water that they're going to pour on flowers or they're digging and these are those movements that you want to keep throughout life. And hey, guess what? If you're sitting on the floor while you're there, you might as well enjoy a little meditation as well and feed your mind and your soul. And I mean, sometimes, like you mentioned, you know, the kids leave sometimes. And sometimes one of the spouses passes on and then people, they kind of like they really lose their kind of mojo in life. And I encourage people, you know, get an animal, get a dog, because then your your that becomes your passion. It becomes your friend. And then you're going for a walk two or three times a day. And some people go for a walk for an hour in the forest. And that's exercise. It's exercise for you and mm -hmm. your, you know, your four-legged friend. I, I love what you said. You bring up the, the dog. We have. 
at the, at the top of each chapter in Hacking Life After 50, there's an image. And we explain this in the introduction that these are, you know, as teachers, we like to show kids things and say, and, and give them an idea without just giving them everything, you know, let them discover. So we carried that teacher uh, idea into our book and we put images at the top of every chapter and we say, what does this give you? It's like a movie trailer. You know, what do you think of this? What do you think this chapter or these strategies might be based on this image? And one of the images is of a dog. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we do talk about what you just said. A big part of Hacking Life After 50 is also community and, and engagement. And this goes back to that whole momentum mindset. And you also mentioned people who may lose a loved one. Isolation and loneliness is a huge problem in after 50s life. So to, in order to nurture mind and soul and body, all those things work together. Yeah, a pet is great. There's tons of research on it. So we've got the picture of the dog. We talk about taking the dog for a walk. And then in addition to taking care of that dog's needs and and enjoying uh, a, you know, a loyal pet, you're also out walking. You're getting sunshine. Natural light is really important. That's a part also of meditation, breathing, all of that, being in that mindset of calm. Uh, so these are really important things. And, and it, and it is a, a, an amalgam of all the strategies, you know, it's, it's movement, it's purpose, it's strength training, it, it's community, it's being in nature. All of these things help you live a long, joy-filled life. I remember because I, I was looking at it, I think it was the Wheel of Fortune or the Wheel of Health. It was kind of like the, the Hunza and the Himalayas were living the longest, you know, well into the hundreds. Mm -hmm. And it was all about crop rotation and just eating healthy and basically no junk. Mm -hmm. So like, it, obviously, nutrition is critical. It's a, it's a huge part. And, and we have, a again, we have a chapter in the book dedicated to nutrition. And, you know, we're very upfront about saying we're not doctors. We're, we're not certified nutritionists. What we are are researchers and practitioners. So anything that's in Hacking Life After 50, we have put a ton of research into from all different sides, uh, very much into the medical profession and the people who are the experts. And then we've gone and tried it. Uh, you know, I share a story about how I was really struggling, you know, uh, some years ago with weight and, and I take some uh, medication that really makes you eat more. And I got to be 30 pounds heavier than I am now. And, you know, I didn't feel good. So, it, you know, I got to that point where I said, I do want to live a long, healthy life. I want to be around for my kids. I want to, maybe they have grandkids. I want to be around for that. Plus I want to explore. We live in a beautiful place, right? The whole world, it's a marvelous place. And I want to explore all the great things out there. And uh, that was when I, my research into uh, dieting and, and all of that started. And we don't really promote any diets. We talk about a balanced nutrition and meal planning. And, uh, you know, you're right. You, you have to be careful what you put into your body. And again, going circling back to the mental and the emotional side, Roy, you know, we, we're talking a lot about meditation and, and mindfulness and all of that. A piece of it is what you're doing uh, to your body? What are you putting into your body? Because if you're putting the wrong things in your body, you're not going to feel like sitting down and meditating. You're going to feel like going to sleep, you know? So yeah, we, we give some real simple strategies for inventorying what you eat, removing some of the bad things, not all, but most, and, you know, work on an 80, 20 plan, 80% 80 good, healthy foods. Talk to your doctor. They'll give you great advice. And, and, you know, don't deprive yourself because a part of this is also joy, right? We want that joy. So don't deprive yourself of everything. There's a nice balance that'll help you live that long, healthy, joy-filled life. Like you mentioned, you're not doctors, but like most of the books that I've read that aren't from doctors, because you come looking at it from a dis different perspective. And I mean, there's the, the thing is, most doctors train under the same system. And they're not trained nutrition. And I mean, I have delved deep into this. There's only one country, I believe it's Albania. They spend six months. The rest, no. So like, and there's times I will talk to doctors. I've got doctor friends 
and I can give them advice that they're unaware of that will actually help them. So, you know, it, like sometimes we think oh, we have to run to, and of course, like there's times that you have to, and they're very, you know, their, their training will help you. But there's other times that, especially I think when it comes to natural, like the, you know, very few will say go out and take a walk in sunlight, you know, <laughs> get exercise and things like that. They'll, they'll throw you the pill. And I think for, for humanity, what you're actually teaching is, is, is a lot better for most people. Yeah, well, I I appreciate that insight. And the thing uh, we talk about doctors and we're, you know, again, throughout we we offer disclaimers, we're not doctors, we're not certified nutritionists, we're practitioners, and always consult with your physician. But what you said is spot on, I will tell you that I used to be a horrendous sleeper. And anytime I got a physical, we would talk about it. But my doctor, who's great, didn't have a ton of advice around sleep because you know that wasn't an area of expertise for her and i was labeled as an insomniac and i'll tell you when i got on this after 50s life journey and living long and healthy in that quest to a healthy hundred and i started researching and, and practicing so many different things one of the things i realized is that sleep is really important you're, you're not gonna live a, a, a super long life i mean unless you just get lucky with genetics you're not gonna live into that 90s to hundreds, if you don't value sleep. So the more research I did, the more I learned about how to get good restorative sleep. And, you know, I saw my doctor, this is going back maybe two years ago on a physical exam. And she, of course, is looking at the chart and sees insomniac and brought up sleep and said, what, what about sleep? And I said, I sleep great. And she said, well, I, I'm, I don't understand. You know, that's always been a problem for you. And she's been my doctor for decades. She said, it, it, that's always been a problem for you. What happened? And I said, well, I started doing some research and I started putting some things into practice and I learned how to help myself be a better sleeper. And, it, you know, I, and a big part of it is what we write about in Hacking Life After 50. And it's a combination of things. She said, give me some specifics. I said, I completely changed how I eat. I said, I, I got rid of the standard American diet, you know, the burgers and the chips and all of the refined carbohydrates and the sugars. I said, I got rid of that stuff, mostly, you know, 80% gone. And um, I said, I started exercising more. You know, and doctors always say exercise. Anytime she saw me and I was 10 pounds overweight or eventually when I was 20 or 30 pounds overweight, she'd say, well, you should exercise more. But, you know, where's the practicality in that? You know, how many times do we hear that from a doctor and go and try it and you don't really have good advice on what to do. It's just like I said with the meditation, she, same thing. She said, years and years ago, try meditation. Okay, well, I don't really know how to do that. So, you know, I think you're right. We do as, as educators and anyone can do this and researchers. I think when you have your own best interest at heart, not that your doctor doesn't care about you, but you have your own best interest at mind, in your mind, right? So the best thing you can do is say, I want to learn everything I can about being the best me. And, and that's what I did. And I put all those things together, the fitness, the, the eating right, meditation, uh, deep breathing, all of the right kinds of things, and then setting up my night for the right kind of sleep. And we get some really specifics in there about sleep hygiene. A lot of people don't understand sleep hygiene. And there's some very specific things about what you can do. But again, we say, if you eat right and if you move a lot throughout the day and you do a little resistance training along with these other strategies, you'll start sleeping well. Yeah. And I think uh, like the technology as well, because some people think, oh, and they use the excuse, oh, somebody needs me or whatever. And it's like reality is what can you actually do? And, you know, having the phone next to you in the bed and or even just having it because sometimes people, they have it and they do turn it off but they have the screen in front of them for the hour before going to bed. And once you start researching these things, you go, no, the phone should stay downstairs and I shouldn't be actually, you know, <laughs> doing that. Well, you couldn't be more accurate on that, Roy. And that's a, that's one of those specific strategies we give, you know, we're talking a lot on the, on the boundaries of all of this stuff, but that's a really great specific one. Uh, the technology and, uh, you know, the blue screens, the TV. I used to have a TV in my bedroom. We we flat out say in Hacking Life After 50, get your TV out of your room. You know, it, if, it, if it's nailed to the wall, put a towel or a blanket over it. Put your remote in another room. 
stop watching TV in bed, you know, and, and that's the other piece of it. You know, bed, there's very specific reasons for a bed. And if you stick to those specific reasons, one being sleep, you actually train your body and mind that when you go to bed, you're going there to sleep. So if you're going there to turn on a TV, you know, that's no good. And then there's, you know, again, we keep, keep circling back to meditation, right? A, a big thing that we recommend is slowing everything down. And again, this comes from a lot of research and also practice. Slow everything down before you're going to bed. You know, uh, don't eat late. Exercise is great. Nutritional eating is great. Don't do it right before bed. Eliminate those things at least three hours before you're going to go to bed. Be intentional about when you sleep. Try to go to sleep the same time. Try to get up the same time. And if you can slow yourself down with a little meditation before you go to sleep, uh, it, it's so powerful. So powerful. Okay. And, you know, like it's something I've never done, but I know that my folks are doing it and I know other people and I say, I can't understand having the television in the bedroom or like do not have a TV. But the other thing is not only on the TV, but on sometimes the alarm clock, you have the red light and that's affecting your sleep and people don't even realize it, but it is actually, you you can actually see that. So you're not getting the proper sleep. And I've even taken it another layer. It's like, I've got this device that, you know, the, energy um rmf or whatever it's like the frequency and all that mm -hmm. and i've realized that yeah you have your light against your bed and you're turning it off but the power is in the cable so mm -hmm. now if i have something on and i'm reading about it, i plug out the lead because it makes a massive difference and i know 99 percent of people don't do that but you actually plug it out from the wall because even if the lead is around your overhead bed and you have mm -hmm. the lead there the energy is actually in that and it's all affecting you because just because yeah. you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not affecting you. No, I, you, you've done your research too, Roy, because you're spot on. We talk about all these things in Hacking Life After 50. Sleep environment, we talk a ton about. And again, most people don't get it. You know, starting with the, the blue lights and the TV and things like that. But what you say about any additional light, we say you make make your bedroom like a cave. You know, it should be dark. Get rid of all the light. Um, cool it down. You know, that's the other thing. It's really important to to have a cool sleeping environment. It doesn't mean you can't sleep without covers. You know, some people are like, I got to have my covers. And I'm like that too. But you want that room cool. We say get it down to 65 or 6. And again, this is research and practice. It's it's We're not making this stuff up. But And there's so much more. There's a, there, you know, again, we, we've dedicated an entire chapter to what we call recharge. And it's all about fueling your body your your brain taking care of your your cellular restoration all of this is really important like just on on the bedroom because i think it's very important because we spend a third of our life actually hoping that we'll sleep properly and especially those with the military background you'll hear them on on stage and they're like make your bed make your bed immediately it sets you up for the morning and i'm one that says no you shouldn't do that it's like open the window and keep the because basically the dust mites and everything in the moisture that's where they grow. So you're making sure you don't have that. Plus you're getting the air that's actually fresh in the room. Mm -hmm. And it makes it makes a big difference. And just simple things, they all add up. You know, it's like the compound effect. But it's exactly it. As I, I've said a few times in our conversation, in Hacking Life After 50, it, it's all cumulative. You know, we, we roll out strategies, one chapter or hack at a time. But we constantly say, now, if you combine this with what we said in this earlier part, you're even going to be better. So it is, there's a compound effect, all of these things and the stuff that the talk about sleep, I love because um, it, it's so underrated and, and there's just so many people. I mean, I have friends and they're like, yeah, I get like four or five hours. That's good for me. And I'm like, Ooh, I, I don't, that's not what the science says. <laughs> Seven to nine hours, Roy, that's what we're looking for. Good restorative sleep, you know? And, and if you're not sure if you're getting restorative sleep, you know, we mentioned technology and the negative side of technology, but we're big fans of wearable tech, you know? So, uh, you know, the, the watches, the rings, anything that has that biosensor and I, and I use one, you know, I, I wear a ring that has a biosensor and it's attached to an app and every morning, and we talk about being intentional about all of this stuff, you know, make it a plan every morning. One of the first things I do when I get up is I, I check my app and say, how did I sleep? 
And, you know, it's amazing how the numbers coincide with how I feel. There's days I get up and I'm like, oh, man, I'm sluggish. I, I don't, I'm not feeling it today. What, what happened? And I look on my app that's connected to my ring and, you know, maybe, maybe I got less than seven hours of sleep. Maybe for whatever reason, I only got, you know, maybe, maybe 10% of my sleep was deep sleep. Well, you need, you know, 18 to 22% needs to be deep sleep. And, and your REM sleep, again, you need to be up in the high teens, low 20% of your sleep needs to be that because it, it, it affects your focus and your thinking and your creativity. Your app will tell you all of this. So, you know, we're, we're tech agnostic. We don't promote any specific kind, but we do think it's a great idea to, to um, measure, you know, your results. Like, I, I suppose this is kind of important as well as we have to, we're all different. Like, for example, you, you mentioned blackout. And I know loads of people do that, but I don't. I have no blinds. And I basically, I don't set an alarm. I just wake up naturally. And I'm waking up five or six. It's kind of, and in the winter, I wake up a bit later. It's like my body kind of adjusts to mm -hmm. the, you know, the seasons. And that works for me. I get fantastic sleep. But on the technology side of things, loads of my friends do that. They all say, oh, I got someone. They have the rings. They have the watches. And I turn off my Wi-Fi. I think it's actually because I have studied that. I've looked at the actual mm -hmm. the technology, the dangers of frequencies and stuff like that. Even though I know it's good and definitely you actually get results for actually analyzing it for a while and seeing what's going mm -hmm. on. But I, 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 I kind of say for on things like that, take them off the watch. The, but you know what the, the you've wifi. done? What you've done, Roy, is something we talk about in Hacking Life After 50 is you have found what works for you. Exactly. And, you know, uh, it, it, you know, who I said earlier, who cares more about you than you? <laughs> exactly. You know? yeah. So so that's a big thing we talk about. And, you know, we have a, a Facebook page called After 50s Life. And, uh, you know, when we talk all about this stuff and we share videos and we share research and stories and podcast episodes and, and, and that are focusing on things like this. And we'll say, hey, give this a listen. But we constantly say, whatever we say, it might be what works best for us. And it's mostly ba all based on some sort of research and, and what the universal feeling in the medical world is. But you still have to find what works for you, you know, so um you know i we promote wearable technology if you say i sleep great i'm i feel regenerated and recharged in the morning and i'm getting that good consistent amount of sleep that i need and you don't need any wearable tech you don't need anything else that's great you sleep with your blinds open and you sleep great that's what is most important do what works best for you the key is getting up and feeling good right absolutely bouncing out of bed and not going to go and oh, have to get up like every day is like yeah, 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 i just feel so good and it's the most important thing and i mean especially like that you previously suffered from insomnia because i think we've all at yeah. some stage go through that and it's like you're then chugging through life and it's like you're you're half asleep you need to get stuff done and it's just you're not firing on all cylinders huh? and yeah. when you kind of crack the code for that and it's brilliant that you were able to figure that out yourself you know that i wasn't the doctor yeah. but i was actually surprised your doctor recommended meditation fair to her for doing that because not not many of them would do that but that was actually uh, great that she yeah. recommended that for sure yeah yeah and, and like i said i mean i you know we promote the, the medical profession and doctors. And we say in numerous chapters in Hacking Life After 50, see what your doctor says. Here, here's a part of nutrition that works for us. Uh, see what your doctor says. Here, here's a part of resistance training that works for us. See what your doctor says. Because, you know, hopefully if you've been seeing a physician for a long time, your general care doctor, hopefully they do know you, you know? So, you know, that's one thing. There's a lot of things with diet that are generally healthy for maybe 80 or 90% of the, of people in the world, but there's that 10 to 20% that they're not good for, you know? So uh, again, the doctor can help you with that, depending on your total, uh, you know, uh, biology and chemistry, they can help you with that it, it, resistance training too. You know, there's a, there's certain things that your doctor might say, this is not the best for you. You shouldn't do this particular movement or this particular lift this kind this way. So, um, yeah, we, I, I love my doctor, but again, and she, the good part was try meditation, you know, and again, didn't work at first, but now it's a part of my every single day life. You know, the other thing was not a whole ton of advice about sleep. 
And I, that one I figured out on my own. And, and you talked about, you know, she, she was willing to learn from me. She said, tell me about this. And she was taking notes. And she said, well, that's all great. She goes, I'm going to recommend that to other patients who are struggling with sleep. So, you know, we're better together than we are apart, Roy. No, love that. Love that. And so your, your, your podcast, because I know you're in the top uh, 2%, but uh, you're doing like solo shows. You're, you, it's not a guest kind of thing. It's like you're, you're just yourself. Yeah. No, no, I am guesting. I Now, I used to have a show on, you know, I created this hack learning series, which our book's called Hacking Life After 50. It's a part of this book series that I created after I left the classroom, you know, over, you know, a decade ago, roughly. And, and most of those books are aimed at teachers and school leaders. But um, I, I started a podcast maybe a decade ago when we started all this, I wanted to get people thinking about this, what we call the hack learning model, you know, just the way we look at problems and we solve problems. So what I would do is just talk to people who were writing books in the series or other educators who were using some of the strategies we used. So that was called the hack learning podcast. I mean, it's out there, but I, I don't really create the episodes anymore. Uh, so right now I'm just doing a lot of this, you know, and I'm, uh, I'm really right now all about this after fifties life, you know, and it's just, we, you know, again, I spent a lot of time. We created this Facebook page. It's got like 5,000 followers already, and it hasn't been around that long, but I think it just resonates with people, you know, these strategies we're discussing and how we're sharing them and sharing a lot of other resources. It isn't just about us. So yeah, right now I'm, I've been doing a lot of this and, and I love it. It's, it's great to, share these strategies and help people. We're on a quest to live to a healthy hundred, Roy, and we want to bring people along. Excellent. And it's just fine because I, I know that like you've got a few different companies, but the, like the publishing and stuff like that. So you might just kind of touch on that to let people know what exactly that you're kind of covering in that. Yeah. Yeah. When I left uh, the classroom, um, you know, and I said for a while I was out um, working with educators and doing some consulting and all of that. Then uh, I, wanted to um, do more books. So I, I wrote a book, the first in this series called Hacking Education. And, you know, it resonated with people. And I had friends who said, you know, this is a this is a cool model that you guys have come up with. You know, this we present a problem and then the hack and then these the most popular part is what you can do tomorrow. It's like, you know, because especially in education, they always tend to be about the five and the 10 year plan, you know, <laughs> and, you know, those can be important to look to the future, but teachers want right now solutions. You know, what can I do tomorrow that's going to make my class better and help make me a better teacher? So that's what that's all about. And um, so once I did that, I started this company times 10 publications and, you know, we're, we're now, we've done like 50 books in, in the last eight years. And this hack learning series for educators has been so popular you know, with books selling all over the world that, and, and people love the model. And I said, you know what, let's start doing, let's use this problem solving model for people who aren't teachers and school leaders. And I think uh, these books will still resonate with them, but you know, the idea is let's branch out, let's do some stuff. Let's help people solve problems in, in all phases of life. And that's where, you know, the first one uh, I'm the co-author of hacking life after 50, because you know, I've, I've been in this after fifties life and this journey for a while. And I was like, you know what, this is an experience I want to share. So we'll be doing more. We've, we're now calling this hack learning life. So the life edition is, is, um, you know, we're going to be doing a lot around health and fitness and business and startups, entrepreneurship, and, you know, all kinds of things. So we're hoping to help a whole lot of people around the world solve problems. Thanks. Oh, brilliant. It's an art. Totally enjoyed our conversation. You might let people know how they can get in contact with you. Yeah. Well, for um, Hacking Life After 50, again, everything is After 50's Life. You can go to after50slife.com and uh, the books there, there's images of me and my co-author, Jim Sturdivant, links to us so people can get to know who we are. Uh, if anybody wants to talk to us or do something like this, there's links on there. And that also goes to the publishing site, uh, Times 10 Publications. So uh, after 50s life.com and then also the the facebook page is called after 50s life and we're there daily so those are the best ways to communicate with us okay i'll make sure and i, I hope people link. check out yeah i hope people check out after 50s life.com and and ultimately you know follow the links there over to the stores and and uh buy hacking life after 50 it's it's uh we think it's going to be a game changer and 
again, we're bringing a lot of people along on this journey to the healthy hundred, Roy. No, brilliant. I love what, I love what we've covered and what you're mentioning and everything. So I think people will benefit from it. So I make sure Thank I you. put the link both on the audio and the video. I put this out obviously on the meditation, but I also put it on the awakening because I'm big into health and making change in the world for the positive. So I think it's uh, very important. So I encourage people to check out the website and make sure when you buy the book, give them a five star rating because it makes a big difference and more people get to see it. So until next week, take care. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating, and share with your friends. And you'll find all my shows with the QR code or bio.link forward slash podcaster, as well as my podcast coaching. And I'd like to thank my sponsor, DanielPacker.com, helping people with anxiety, stress, and addictions. He's got a 90% success rate, and you only pay if you're successful. Also, if you'd like to go on a podcasting tour, I can help you do that. And if you're interested in sponsorship, you can contact me on my bio.link forward slash podcaster. Until next week, take care.